to gallop out of the theater and shoot up the whole neighborhood. <laughs> Got you right in the heart. Hey, you cuckoo. You cuckoo. You missed me a while. Bing! Welcome to Twilight Pwn. My name is John. I'm joined by my co-host, Fred. Whoa, I feel really ungrounded. Are we not I know, the oh, internet's <laughs> third most popular Twilight Zone podcast anymore? I was just so excited to say hello to the nice <laughs> folks this week. Okay, uh, yes, we're still the crap podcast <laughs> that talks about the Twilight Zone. <laughs> well, a hearty bread. Sharon and Tom still have us beat. So, yeah. uh, one day, Johnny, one day. <laughs> well, uh, normally you'd ask me about my week, but I'm going to ask you. you. You met a very very special person this week didn't you I oh got, yeah. my yeah i um you know i've recently relocated to pittsburgh and it's been hard meeting new people yeah but uh i took my kiddo to the carnegie science center because it was free <laughs> that day and i'm cheap thanks mr money mustache <laughs> and who would be hanging out around there kind of you know mixing with some of the other illustrious robots of the day but robbie oh man he was, he's there so um i'm I'm on a mission to go back in there, sneak him a bottle of bourbon, but uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll you keep can... you guys updated if I can get a photo. <laughs> yeah, please, uh, yeah, see if you can sneak in like a Smirnoff ice and hold it up <laughs> next to Robbie. <laughs> <laughs> the new Zim guard comes over. Uh, sir, you're the fourth person to do that today. <laughs> right. mm-hmm. uh, so what are we uh, talking about this week? This week we're going to slow things down a bit from that <laughs> dizzying high to yeah. discuss the incredible world of Horace Ford. <laughs> A long title for a long fourth season episode. Just the title. I don't know. <laughs> the Incredible World. Well, they had to sell it somehow. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. I won't. I won't give up the goose. Let's 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 hear yeah. Rod talking about it. Uh, well, it's the 117th episode of the production run. It aired originally on April 18th, 1963. Mr. Horace Ford, who has a preoccupation with another time, a time of childhood, a time of growing up, a time of street games, stickball, and hide and go seek. He has a reluctance to check out a mirror and see the nature of his image, proof positive that the time he dwells in has already passed him by. But in a moment or two, he'll discover that mechanical toys and memories and daydreaming and wishful thinking and all manner of odd and special events can lead one into a special province, uncharted and unmapped, a country of both shadow and substance known as the Twilight Zone. He's the word special like six times in there. (laughs) Well, you know, it's like I, I a feel loving like, parent. You want to be nice. It's yeah, a special I, episode. I, yeah. um, John and I like to write our own Sterling style intros. I have one that I doubt I will be able to get through in one take, so I probably should go first. All right. You ready? Go for it. Hey, you remember how kids used to use old Pharmacola bottles as bowler pins and snap their suspenders every time the 2 o'clock milkman came by, do you? Hey, you remember when you used to play Mumbles and Nine Pins out on the back 40 and you'd prop up an Aggie and it'd go, hey, honey, ha-ha, and the old gray mare would chew a farthing's worth of O. Henry bars? You remember that? Remember how you'd go all rum cub on your buck learning and you'd be in the dickens with your ma? So you'd slick back your forelock with a smitty of horse oil and spit shot in your Benjamin Franklins until they gleamed like a $2 nickel? You remember how kids used to eat dead cats they found in the street? Put rhubarb in the pants? Do you? Ah, uh, those were the good old days. Back in the Twilight Zone. <laughs> that was one take, folks. Yeah, that well, wasn't and what a take. Seamlessly stitched together. That wasn't <laughs> yes. any Birdman crap. That was one real take. <laughs> one real take of nonsense. I hope at least <laughs> one word of that was intelligible. I got a couple. Uh, you know. Cool. You know, it was fun to make up uh, fake yeah. old-timey nonsense. Hey, Henny Ha Ha was a good one. <laughs> All right, what you got? Mr. Horace Ford spends his days making childish things while thinking childish thoughts. One can draw a straight line from his occupation through to his preoccupation. Stuck in the present, his heart longs for a past of Revolvio, hot potatoes, three-cent scoops of ice cream, Willoughby 1890s banking regulations, and other wholesome chestnuts of a bygone era. It's time for Mr. Ford to take a trip into his past to learn a valuable life lesson. As often happens, every eighth episode or so, (laughs) in the Twilight Zone. (laughs) That's good. Um, So this is a fourth season episode of the Twilight Zone, which means it's an hour long. Um, It also means it cannot be found on Netflix. So if you want to check it out before we spoil it, 
uh, do so on Hulu or, of course, buy the Blu-rays and DVDs. And definitely get that special fourth-season-only mm. edition. <laughs> if you're going to buy one season of The I Twilight wondered. Zone. Yeah, I guess yeah. they probably did sell them as, like, single sets. Yeah. It'd be nice to know the sales figures. I, I imagine yeah. there'd be a dramatic dip. Around if you're, like, our one kooky listener who, like, only loved the fourth season, there's always <laughs> kind of, like, you know, somebody out there yeah. kind of, like... Really thinks like Hudson Hawk is the best movie ever sure. made, or you know, there's, yeah, there's, I knew a person who like that. Huh. Yeah, there, yeah, there is like, there's always the contrarian. Yeah, and if you're that, please write in and let us know. <laughs> um, but yeah, let's get going with the ample plot um, mm-hmm. of the Incredible World. <laughs> the title makes me laugh. We open on some sentimental music, um, which we've heard before in other yeah. sentimental episodes. So that's plus one in my rating already. <laughs> right. Yes, good. Starting good. And uh, we uh, meet our main character, Horace Ford. Um, he's like a toy designer. Yeah, and my immediate thought was like, oh boy, here comes a Beavis. Yeah. He's got a very, you know, quirky office space. <laughs> my immediate thought was, oh, do we have to spend an hour with this guy? <laughs> like, I don't mind the half hours with this kind of character, but... Anyway, he, he's 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 uh, whimsical and he's kind of like a, a grown uh, man child in Warby Parker glasses. And uh, his coworker comes in and they're they're uh, arguing about the design of a robot toy, mm-hmm. um, Robbie with real drinking action. Right. <laughs> and uh, I guess the character that's set up is I mean mainly he's just very juvenile. Like when his coworker comes in, he like squirts some water in his face with a fake flower and shoots him with a cat pistol and then you know like it's just he, he's he, i don't know if they're going for like charmingly young or just I, I really annoying i think this is supposed to be charming okay. i think this is something we'll just wrestle with throughout yeah but i think this was an actor's thing of how to capture this like whimsical kind of uh, arrested development I mean, I think you should be thinking Tom Hanks and Big, but instead yeah. you're thinking, I don't know, <laughs> Tom Hanks in Nothing But Trouble or I don't some like <laughs> terrible, he, terrible he, movie he, he didn't do. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, did Tom was Tom Hanks? No, he wasn't. Oh. He wouldn't have made that decision. I think so. Okay. Um, yeah. He's annoying. Let's but just I, get that. I don't out know. There. I yeah. did enjoy. So they have a kind of debate about price measures on this toy. Yeah, and Horace. The way he sticks up for the toy made me laugh. There's something wrong with this. There is not. I designed that toy. There's nothing wrong with that toy. Kids will be crazy about that. Listen, you know what that does? I know what I it mean, does. I mean, a toy where the eyes light up and Horace, it talks and everything. But it's a good toy. <laughs> I just feel like yeah. something about that's a good toy. Like, that's a good toy. Yeah, yeah, it's like kind of Jimmy Stewart. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know. I feel like he's sticking up for like a guy who's got a drinking problem on the job. Like, he's a good toy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You come in my office and tell me that's not a good toy. That's a good toy. <laughs> uh, he really, I don't know. The, this, you know, characterization progresses. He's very much like an auteur toy designer who kind of like yeah. won't back away from what's right, even though like right. you know, the studio is interfering. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, I got it. It took me a few minutes, but yeah. I think you you should be thinking like Tom Hanks in uh, yeah. in Big, but you kind of get stuck thinking of Robin Williams in Toys. Oh, okay. Yeah, interesting. There you go. There, that yeah. makes more sense yeah okay um another side note did you notice how horace ford only has four fingers on his left hand well they they do an insert shot yeah. of his fingers yeah which you know there'd be nothing i guess inherently wrong with an insert shot of a hand but it's just yeah. an odd choice to keep it in when the guy's missing a portion of a finger like yeah i was it, like is this it just some... makes you think that it's gonna have a role to play but yeah. it's just the actor just happens to be missing a portion of his finger. Which I guess which, is not really fair. Like, it's just, I couldn't help but think, like, oh, that's going to come back. And then right. it was really clearly, I was like, oh, I'm a horrible person. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, let's move along. Well, we'll explain that missing finger later in bios and trivia. <laughs> yes, yes. Coming up. <laughs> <laughs> One scene down, 48 to go. <laughs> um... Uh, his wife arrives in the office. Um, I was kind of surprised he was married based on his character. Uh, but I think right around here I have the note, which could just be Ibid. Yeah. Big feel to it all. Yeah. Yes. There's a, there's a bigness. Um, yeah, he's married uh, against all odds, and she's come to the office to plan like a surprise party for his 36 plus 2 uh, birthday party. 
And it's, it just starts to feel like a weird, like, like an episode of Mad Men or something. Like the <laughs> boss comes in to chew Horace out for the complexity of his robot toy. Oh, well, this is this is kind of in the same wheelhouse. But <laughs> I've got a lot of clips from, like, the okay. first 15 minutes, All and right. then my head started to hurt. All so right. let's okay. just get them out. Do you know how much we could lose if we put this toy into production the way it is? That's a good toy. <laughs> Very good, but that has nothing to do with it. Now, this robot toy is too complicated. There are too many parts, and I want it simplified. Oh, what do you want to simplify? Well, the eyes don't have to light up. Sure, the eyes have to light up. <laughs> what, do you want to ruin the whole thing? The eyes lighting up, that's the beauty part. That's a terrific thing. What's the matter, Horace? Nothing. Well, you're just talking about ruining the whole thing. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's supposed to be childlike, but it, it really does come off like mildly demented and kind of yeah. worrisome when yeah. he plays it so big. <laughs> Just had a thought. What if that character was played by Charles Bronson? <laughs> That's a good toy. <laughs> I think it would have sounded really menacing. Yeah. Like, why you want to take the eyes off? That's a good toy, fella. <laughs> the boss just slowly backs out of the <laughs> office. Anyway, um, Horace sort of continuing in his role as the uncompromising genius of the toy company. <laughs> He's sort of like the McNulty of the toy office. Yeah, you know? totally. <laughs> Uh, the boss, I yes. believe when he's chewing him out about the toy, yeah, he pulls out like a little centerfold spread with blueprints. Did you yeah. notice anyone in there? Was Robbie in there? Or was there a building code know. on under I don't fire? know if he got paid, but there's someone who has a suspicious figure. Really? Not unlike our friend Robbie there. We might need to throw that on the you Tumblr. Know, I but. feel like I looked for it, but I didn't see it. Maybe I was just looking at the wrong... Mm. But last week, you, you really burned me on air. Well, maybe I just have stars in my eyes right now, <laughs> so maybe I'm seeing them everywhere. True, true. You're blowing it, John. <laughs> <laughs> totally. No, Fred. <laughs> um, so Horace gets home, and I was, I was very... I don't know if you were confused by this, but I was mm-hmm. very confused about like his home life, because... There's an older woman who seems to be chewing him out and sort of like a, his mother lives with him and his wife, basically, right? right? That, that's what Yeah, it was. I think that's okay. the situation, which I think for the writing maybe is, helps emphasize that he's a man-child. Yeah. But I don't know. I just think like, oh, it's the 60s. In the old days, there were weird living situations. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It seemed like something that maybe like an immigrant family like or someone who didn't have a lot of money, you know? But yeah, and this guy's like a master toy designer, <laughs> yes, so exactly. he's got to be rolling in it. <laughs> he's the Darren Aronofsky of the toy world. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he has a vision, Fred. <laughs> yes. Anyway, so he annoys um, everyone, uh, his uh, mother, his wife, and myself, uh, by going on uh, another one of his sort of like reveries about how things used to be when he was a kid. This is a yeah. common refrain throughout the episode. Mm-hmm. And it's so incongruous because like the sentimental music is playing and it just sounds like it's supposed to be very sweet, but he, he kind of like resembles like Hitler, like going to, like on a bit, like, and we were going when I was young, we played mumbly peg and like it's, <laughs> it's just feels very weird. A small thing in this episode's cr- to its credit, I yeah. feel like there was some good camera work in this apartment. They did a good job of okay. setting out the space. Sure. Though I did notice there was a weird edit when they're at the dinner table. He kind of storms off, and then it immediately cuts to him in the bedroom, and it kind of made it look like there was a bed in the dining room. <laughs> but I don't think that's what they were going for. Yeah. Did you notice when he, like, gets angry at them, he storms into his bedroom, and he lays down, like, in that perfect <laughs> yes. childlike way of, like, just planking face yeah. down on the bed? Yeah, kind of, <laughs> like, like, biting his pillow. And- right. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, there was probably a question of, like, how far do we want to push this, you know, man is child thing? And right. They, they pushed it. They, they were, yeah, they were ready, willing to take some risks. So it's next, consistent. Yeah. Points for consistency. Yeah. Plus one. Okay. We've already, we're already up to two for your rating. <laughs> so I'm excited to see where it comes in. Um, in the next scene, Horace is uh, going to revisit um, his childhood street. It's called Randolph Street, where he grew up. And credit to the production design of this episode, it's like a Hieronymus Bosch painting of an old-timey <laughs> neighborhood. It's like there's an Italian dude selling watermelon. There's like an old lady leaning out of a window. There's like people playing hula hoop. It's just like crammed to the brim with like signifiers. You know what I mean? Yeah, I maybe, I don't know. We can maybe cut this, but this scene plays about eight times during the episode. Yeah. So I'll just throw it out here. This is him stumbling onto Randolph Street. Frank on the roll. Three cents each. Bread and butter. (laughs) Davy! You come home or you're gonna get smacked! Ah, 
<laughs> thanks, thanks, Mario. Watch where you're going. It's just so. like a progression of ethnic stereotypes. Just walks up to him and <laughs> delivers their thing. I assume you grabbed that clip because of bread and butter, right? I mean, that was interesting. Yeah. Since if you remember, it was back in Nick of time. I'd never even heard of that. Right. So we're getting our, our second helping of bread and butter. But yeah. um, just in general, I don't know. It's, figured maybe it needs to be there i don't know yeah well that's the old that's his old timey randolph street neighborhood yeah. um and i think that there's a, it's to indicate that it that's not supposed to feel like the 60s right like it's supposed to feel right. like he stepped back in time again yeah. very difficult to tell watching it in 2015 but like you know the three cents for a hot dog there's a there's an inflation, inflation calculation later no i have to I rue the day I made that clip. I, I I didn't do the math, but I think that three cents for a hot dog would would have been underpriced even in 1963. So, and he bumps into some kids again. I will say, I thought the sets were impressive. No, I agree. I I, was as a, I said, uh, the, okay, the production you were being design. serious. Yeah. yeah, it's it's a good set. Yeah, yeah. It it feels like like a you know like a it feels very expansive and large. Everything in this episode feels big <laughs> yes. for better or worse. Yes, more often for worse. <laughs> but the street scene is impressive. Yes. Um, he bumps into some kids, and one of them sort of turns around to look at him. He really looks a lot like Jughead from the Archie comics. That was my hot or not on yeah. that. He's yeah, got, that's, he's that's got... kinder, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. he just... He's, like, very conspicuously missing a front tooth, and he's got that Jughead hat, you know? You know, he could be in Children of the Corn, Urban Harvest, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, he and Horace lock eyes. Um, well, Horace is very scared of this kid for some reason, or it seems shocking to see this kid. Mm-hmm. And we soon find out why, because when he gets home, he's got to tell his wife, Laura, something. And that something is that those, you know, crazy kids were the same ones as the ones he grew up with. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, at this point, you know, Laura, the wife, just kind of like writes it off as another silly fantasy. But Jughead shows up at the door to give Horace his watch back. And mm-hmm. that's supposed to be ominous for some reason. I didn't. Anyway, uh, it's all very mysterious and spooky. And uh, then we get back to um, Horace's office, Mm -hmm. uh, where Mr. Judson, that's his boss, shows up to chew Horace out about the robot uh, toy design. Well, I think before the boss returns, we get what might be one of the most important exchanges of the episode. This is him talking to his coworker. Yes. I saw a kid last night. You ever on, on Randolph Street? Well, it doesn't make any difference. Randolph is, is my old street when, when I was a kid. He's wearing knickers. This kid I saw. You remember when you used to wear knickers with, a, with the buckles and all? They're all the time slipping down them. So he was wearing these. Kids never wear knickers anymore. I'm telling you, never. But he is wearing these knickers. And- it was definitely, that's my first point for the rating. <laughs> the repetition of the word knickers. Oh, I, I do have a hot or not. Oh, yeah. Uh, Nick Frost, the heavier actor from Shaun of the Dead and uh, Hot Fuzz and The yeah. World's End, you think? Yeah, that, no, that's yeah, it's a good, it's a good way to put it. I mean, he he's got these very thick glasses on, so that's yeah, you that have to imagine kind of that distracts that, but, a little yeah. bit. But he's like those. a you know, he's a big kind of pudgy, lovable guy. Kind of is his, his yeah. look. I mean, honestly, he looks and sounds a lot like a person I know, and I don't want to say any more <laughs> details. <laughs> is it me off, or off chance? No, no, no. <laughs> okay, in the All off right. off chance, this person ever ever would listen to this which i doubt i just i don't think anyone ever wants to be compared to <laughs> the horse horse board but yeah. it was a little jarring at times yeah. you think but, that guy gets uh whoever this person is gets stopped on the street <laughs> you look just uh, like horse <laughs> probably not but uh <laughs> how's your incredible world going <laughs> since i got it i'll just go ahead and throw out one more classic horse ford bit I was a very good ring alivio player, so you got to be very fast. You need a lot of stamina. Boy, the running you have to do. See, first, you choose upside. Oh, one potato, two potato, three potato, four. <laughs> hey, you remember that? You remember that? And then one side's got to hide. So this time, see, I'm hiding behind the grocery, back behind where to keep the cartons in off. And horror. And I- <sighs> You're probably, as a listener, thinking, now wait, how did that fit into the story? <laughs> No idea. <laughs> yeah, no idea. Can't you wouldn't know from watching the episode. Yeah, Just, I mean, at some point, one of the kids in the old timey world shouts out "Ring Alivio," but like, I don't know. I, I mean, "Ring Alivio" is presumably a kids' game. Um, mm-hmm. 
<laughs> you know this episode is bad because normally I'd be jumping on Wikipedia to find out what Ring Alivio is. <laughs> There's well, just... it's only like one of the 800 <laughs> yes. little signifiers from his childhood he's thrown at us. You yeah. know, there's only so much. Yeah, yeah. So Horace's boss comes in, and he's there to chew uh, Horace out about uh, something with the robot toy design. And Horace uh, pitches a fit and storms out of the office because he won't compromise his vision. Mm-hmm. And the boss finds quite the poem on Horace's desk. It's a uh, <laughs> drawing of the boss as a goofy-looking robot. Yeah, it was pretty pretty effed up that he would go there. Yeah, yeah. But I will say again, if you look at the torso, which I'm looking right now, I feel like Robbie was somehow yeah. involved here. It's got kind of a Robbie build. I mean, the head is pure Judson, but... <laughs> Pure Judson. <laughs> Does it said like Judsotron or something? Or was it- no, it just says... Just as Mr. Judson, in case <laughs> lest, lest the boss or the viewer be confused uh, about this. Right, exactly. So Horace goes home, and um, he keeps going with these nostalgic reveries. Really increasingly feel like the rants of a lunatic. Mm-hmm. Uh, and at this at this point, he storms out again, upset about something or other, and goes back to Randolph Street. And yeah, it's, it, it, is it the same shot? Uh, it seemed I don't know. I mean, I think they're trying to convey that like this uh he can keep wandering into this exact moment, but it feels like they're just recycling the shot. Yeah. It's it's not just like ten seconds, it's like a minute long yes. establishing you know, it's like the opening from Goodfellas if they had just kept playing it over <laughs> yes. and over again. Yes, it really is. It's weird. <laughs> they just copy paste the establishing shot and it's like, uh I don't know. Anyway, yeah. in this one he follows the kids a little bit but then can't quite figure out what he's doing there I, maybe that's some editorializing but he doesn't know why he's chasing them and uh he leaves um once again his wife is worried about him jughead once again shows up and the wife just very there's just something comical about how seriously she's like thank you for the watch jughead and then just like holds it to her chest ominously Horace's wife shows up at work. I mean, these scenes really just do repeat. Like everyone's worried about Horace. His interactions Horace with, is yelling and yeah. regaling people with tales of childhood. I kind of started wondering, like, what are the stakes here exactly? Like, <laughs> are we worried about the robot toy project? Are we worried about the relationship? <laughs> like, what what's going? You know, why why do we? It's care? a good toy, friend. <laughs> it's a good toy. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, did you kind of? have that thought as well i mean i didn't have thoughts because you know <laughs> as it started happening as unfortunately sometimes happens with these four seasons yeah. my mind started drifting and yeah. so <laughs> i think we're getting you've had a lot of like asides about like the editing and the camera work and i, I tried to get the good stuff in. <laughs> i feel like we're getting to the point where we're not going to have too much more mm-hmm. john observation going for forward um at some point the boss comes in um for the like five or 600th time and at this point he's actually asking Horace to take a leave of absence and uh, Horace just says no and he's fired and then he goes home to tell the bad news to his mother uh, and wife and it it starts to feel like death of a salesman around here like it there's no real discussion of the magical stuff they're just like what are we gonna do and he's like I'm (laughs) nothing without that job and like (laughs) They're all talking about what he's going to do, and then suddenly the mom kind of decides it's time for her to climb up on the cross and yeah. hits him with this line. What did I do wrong? <laughs> Ever. In my whole life. <laughs> Classic mom. <laughs> I'll just lie down in this garbage heap. <laughs> right, right. Um, we find out at this point uh, that Horace was making $140 a week, which in today's money... Inflation Calculation 57 grand um, Which is kind of like It's a weird amount of money Because it's not like a ton But it's not, not I mean I guess for a toy designer That's pretty good that money seems, I think that seems reasonable For a toy designer It seems like he could like Afford to put his mom up In like a I think the mom lives in the house Much more for Story purposes yeah. than financial yeah. planning. <laughs> You're purposes. probably right. She's like, I would get my own place, but the story. <laughs> Thematically, I have to live here. I've been telling you that. So Horace has just been fired, and the scene just really starts to escalate. And it 
feels like one of those scenes where like the uh, actors just like started to roll dice as to like the intensity of how they delivered each line. It just feels like everyone's yelling, and I wanted people to just calm down and get through the episode, and mm-hmm. you know, keep it keep it chill. So Horace goes back to Randolph Street. Um, we get the same shot, and he sees the kids again, and he follows them, and it's not clear what he wants, but he starts. He says he wants to talk to them. They, yeah, at some point he did overhear them kind of complaining, grousing yeah. that someone didn't invite them to his birthday party. And there's yeah. been some talk from the wife about how she's planning this big surprise party. So we probably connected those dots at some point. Yeah, probably. Yeah. There, maybe. There's story stuff happening. Yeah, and know. you know, at this point he starts yelling at the kids. Um, mm-hmm. They don't seem to acknowledge him, which is weird because everybody else in this old-timey tableau acknowledged him. But for the reasons of the story, they don't. Until mm-hmm. at some point they cut away and they cut back and he's a pudgy little kid. Yeah. And yeah, right. it's weird because like normally the Twilight Zone like will give you like a... They'll give you something. They'll give you an old European guy who gives the character a stopwatch. Or they'll give you, like, mm-hmm. a rim that's 100 yards away. <laughs> they, they normally give you more than, like, a cutaway. You know what yeah. I mean? Well, yeah, I guess the thing is they've already given us one fantastical thing that he's going back in time. Yeah. And so when they throw this other, like, he becomes a kid curveball at us, it's a little jarring yeah, for well, folks who are still paying attention. Yeah, I, I think it's like, you know, you'll accept that one initial thing, but then once you're in the new world, it's like... Are yeah, you just he didn't turn into up? a kid the second he walked into the yeah. old world, so it's confusing what caused it to happen this time. Yeah, well, again, the answer is the plot. Right. Uh, so once he becomes this pudgy little kid, um, we find out that the other kids... It must be said he's, like, 60s pudgy. Yes. You know, true. which means he's just got some, like, adorable cheeks. He's not, you know, like, I have a fat baby next up on Maury. Yeah, Povich, you know, fat. He's true. He's I little... didn't mean it pejoratively. I mean, you know, okay. He's he, like he's chubby and sort of like the what's the guy from the Sandlot with the freckles? Oh gosh, ham. Nice. Ham. He's a ham kind of chubby, not an Angus chubby. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. Uh, he finds out once he's you know transformed into kid mode that mm-hmm. his his buds um, don't remember him as fondly as he remembers them. The yeah. kids are bummed about not being invited to a birthday party, which we now find out right. has been Horace's birthday party. So, right. And it, we get some very aggressive apple eating. Yes. Kind of exactly, foreshadowing. Yes. I don't know if you noticed. The kids kind of circle him yeah. and they start taking some some pretty aggro nasty bites. bites. Yeah. yeah, some pretty aggro bites out yeah. of those apples. And they, they also they say they're going to marbleize him, which I thought was kind of... A, like, Sounds delicious. Yeah. I don't know. Is that like turn him into a steak or what? I th- yeah, I think yeah, so. Okay. I think that's gonna, good. Yeah. Um, so they move in for the beat down and mm-hmm. we cut away and uh, we're in the present day again. And um, the wife uh, answers the door um, and uh, it's not, um, I forgot the character's name, Horace Ford. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's Jughead again. Mm-hmm. And, he gives the wife a watch, and this time it's not Horace's present day watch, but it's his Mickey Mouse watch, which he had talked about annoyingly earlier. So the wife is kind of worried about that, so she goes down to Randolph Street to find him, and she looks down an alley. It's later at night, so everybody's uh, gone in for the night, and she sees. Am I interpreting this right? She sees a, a kid Horace lying down in an alley, and then she turns away and looks back again, and it's adult Horace? I think that happened, yes. I think we're just supposed to interpret it as, like... A, yeah, it seems like she's a little more in on the magic than you <laughs> yeah, think she should yeah, be. Yeah, it's weird. He's beat up, and he, he asks her not to ask him, you know, to explain this whole thing, but he's quite willing to explain the meaning of the episode. Yes. I don't know what happened to you either, Horace, but I think we're all like that. We remember what was good, and we black out what was bad. Maybe because we couldn't live if we didn't. Uh, and uh, as uh, they walk away, I did kind of like this final parting shot of like panning up to the top of uh, the street lamp and mm-hmm. Jughead sitting up there looking rather ominous, I must say. Totes. Yeah, something totes about ominous. him like just sitting up there grinning with his one tooth, like kind of like seeing the hobgoblin. At the, you know. <laughs> anyway, and that's the end of the episode. What do you got to say, Sterling? Exit Mr. and Mrs. Horace Ford who have lived through a bizarre moment not to be calibrated on normal clocks or watches. 
Time has passed, to be sure. But it's the special time in the special place known as the Twilight Zone. All of us are Horace, aren't we, John? <laughs> when you're right down to it. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, to me, the biggest thing in this episode, <laughs> which is kind of rare that we talk about like actors' performances all that much, yeah. but the performance of the actor who plays Horace Ford really makes the episode feel very weird. Because oh, yeah. he he feels less like a Beavis type of guy who's out of step with the modern world and more just like someone who's genuinely disturbed. You know what I mean? For as much as we rip on this episode, I feel like there's a good episode somewhere in here. It's called Walking think, Distance. <laughs> totally. I think the biggest problem with this entire episode is the acting. Yeah. Specifically of Horace Ford. I think, you know, I don't know if it's as written if it could be played in a way that like is really compelling but this actor just went like 10 times too far and made him unbelievably grating when he was supposed yeah. to be charming yeah i, I kind of wonder too <laughs> it's like it's like they gave like a whimsical role to ted de yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, men have to play Romy cup or whatever the hell it is <laughs> what was it ronalivio ring ring I kept thinking Rufio in my head, and then I just end up at Bangarang, and it just gets... I'm a child, <laughs> Mr. Hermes, for no clear reason. Yeah. I still wonder whether we would accept it, because I feel like audiences can accept a character who, like, misses the general idea of childhood and the simplicity of their mm-hmm. youth. But something about someone who's like, man, I wish I could play Ring Olivio right now. Like, it, there's just, like, kind of no dignity in that on some level. Like, what's the difference between, like, feeling nostalgic for your youth and getting, like, overly obsessed about micro machines? You know what I mean? <laughs> like, what, what? The writing, yes, could probably have been toned down, too. So maybe that's a problem on both. Yeah. But as far as the big question of, like, what's just kind of whimsical nostalgia and when does it become kind of, like, worrisome niche? Yes. Yeah. Well, like, okay, think about Walking Distance, which is a very similar yeah. episode. I mean, you know, some might say identical. And, you know, a character goes back in time to his past that he really idealizes mm-hmm. it. He maintains his dignity just because he doesn't... He's kind of like walking through his past and appreciating it, but he's not actually trying to like play like jacks with other kids. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, he, yeah, it would be weird if he were like running to the carousel and like, oh man, I gotta get five rides in. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this is gonna be awesome. Like, <laughs> yeah, there's just a. Well, I think there's something kind of interesting about about that. It's kind of revealing about nostalgia in the sense that it's like yeah. th- those things are merely the signifiers for the way you felt. They're not doing those things in your present day isn't going to bring them back. You know, yeah. as anyone who has played with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle action figures. <laughs> As a thirty-year-old, will will learn quickly. You know, we can we can have a drink and fondly remember how great Neverending Story was. <laughs> but like people who you know cosplay and go to the midnight screening of it, it's like oh, I feel bad about them. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Speaking as someone who like, I would I would genuinely say The Wizard is one of my favorite movies. So I don't know. Yeah, but you like that in part. Knowing that it's got its flaws. True, like, true. I think you know, you're not like enjoying it at the level you were when you were 10 years yes. old and just thinking, like, guys, you gotta see, it's got footage from Super Mario Bros. <laughs> yes, 3. From the Power Glove. You've got yes. to watch this shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, totally true. I don't know. But it is, I think it's interesting because it shows you, like, the, you know, the folly of nostalgia and that it, not, not that it's a bad thing. I mean, I, I like being nostalgic, but you, when, you, when you follow it to its logical extension, you're like, oh, that's kind of ridiculous. You know what I mean? One of the things that makes me think there's a good episode in here yeah. somewhere is the fact that he has this vision of his past, which, you know, I think they clutter up with just too many signifiers and junk, like yeah. Ring Alivio and Hot Potato and blah, blah, blah. At its basic level, he has this remembrance of a really enjoyable childhood with good friends that he doesn't have now. He lives with his mom and his wife and he doesn't seem to have real friends and then he gets back to his past and his friends don't like him and are angry and beat him up and he kind of remembers things weren't as good as i've romanticized them yeah like that's at least slightly different than the walking distance take like walking distance 
he doesn't learn that the past wasn't as good as he remembered. He just learns that he needs to let go of the past and live in the present. It's a, right. it's a different lesson. Right. There's a good episode in here somewhere. It's not called Walking Distance. It's called The Trouble with Templeton. Exactly. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I do agree with you. I think it becomes a little more muddled in The Trouble with Templeton because it's like the past is pretending that things weren't as good as they really were. But like yeah, the past I mean, is I, actually I agree. Great. I don't yeah. think Templeton actually has that message. I think the past was pretty great. Yeah. But, but you know what like I mean? trying to let him... Yeah. Make him let go. The past so. is like effing with his head to make it seem that way. <laughs> no, I agree, and I think that's a good message. It's just that it's so confused because it's like, I don't know. The the main thing that it seems to bother him is that people don't want to listen to his crazy, rem, you know. Right. It's, it's, that's a problem with the character, I yeah. think. It, it's kind of suggested that the problem is that he misses this more whimsical, simple time. But, yeah. like, yeah, he just seems, like, so off-putting to everyone. Yeah. It's, like, no wonder that things aren't very good right here. Yeah, and it's, like, to give him the character of, like, a toy designer who won't compromise on aesthetics. <laughs> it's, it's, what is his, like, unwillingness to compromise on the robot toy supposed to tell us about anything? You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I guess I don't really know other than maybe he's just so hardened into his yeah. views on life which have like hardened into him thinking the past is all great and so he really gets a shock when he yeah. sees it was different but i would really have liked to see what a 30 minute version of this episode with a different lead actor would look like <laughs> yeah. I'm, no, I'm no, serious. i know i agree, I think I agree there's, yeah. i'm maybe if they had 30 minutes they could have like the writer maybe could have streamlined some of these ideas and made them more yeah I don't know. And if they, yeah, and if it was set at Christmas time and uh, a little bit more sentimental music, yeah, yeah. just maybe out throughout the entire episode, <laughs> never stopped. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. Anything else? Now let's move on. What we doing next? Bios and trivia. So, as you slightly alluded to, this story was originally written by Reginald Rose. It was actually presented on a show called Studio One right. in 1955. So, that version starred Art Carney, who you'll right. remember from yeah. Night of the Meek. I, I'll maybe try and track this down, because I think he would have been able to play kind of the humor, but maybe not it so over the top. It also had, like, Jason Robards in it. It was kind of like an all-star <laughs> cast. Yeah, yeah. So... Um, and apparently the ending was slightly different, but I don't think the Zikri book really goes into the detail. Can you kind of fill me in yes. on the differences? Yes, Graham's uh, to the rescue. At the end, um, I think it just ends with uh, Jughead delivering the Mickey Mouse watch, mm -hmm. and uh, that's the end of the episode. So Horace doesn't you know, come back to the present. He just remains as a kid. Um, oh, he's stuck as a kid forever? Yeah. Or, well, um, and it's kind something. of interesting. We talk about this a lot on the show about how, like, the Twilight Zone feels the need to spell stuff out for like audiences of the time and don't they have any respect for the audience but apparently when that original ending aired on the Studio One broadcast of the same mm -hmm. idea they got like you know thousands it says a large number of letters over a thousand asking for clarification regarding the <laughs> ending so I think people just weren't accustomed to seeing like fantastical stories you know yeah but that would have been an hour long too like this was this was very similar script right i mean i don't know if it was word for word grams doesn't say but it right. sounds pretty similar yeah yeah okay so the poster for o'shaughnessy's boy yes mentions which is seen on the old timey street scene mentions one of its stars jackie cooper who we might remember as the tortured child actor who grew into an old man jonathan west in caesar and me oh nice he was the guy whose uncle like pretended that he'd killed the guy's <laughs> kid's dog. So, oh god! Oh boy! Stars Pat Hengel and Nan Martin, who played Horace and Laura Ford, reunited the following year to play husband and wife Mike and Pauline Decker on The Fugitive, hmm. an episode of The Fugitive. They also played a husband and wife in a play entitled JB, which was a modern retelling of the story of Job. Oh, so <laughs> that's weird. JB is yeah. a swinging seventies coke dealer. <laughs> totally. <laughs> So that's my trivia. What do you got? Yeah, I mean, the Martin Grams just goes uh, to great lengths to uh, illuminate the whole thing with Reginald Rose. It is kind of interesting because apparently a guy at CBS sent Sterling like a, 
you know, a reel of this thing that they'd aired on Studio One right before the Twilight Zone was going to be produced. But Sterling mm. actually turned it down because they had walking distance in production. Oh, okay. So it was kind of like, oh, we don't want to have the same idea. And apparently a couple years later, a columnist named Edith Efron wrote an editorial uh, called Can a TV Writer Keep His Integrity? Um, and it was, I think it was in TV Guide, and it was a backhanded slap at Serling, who, uh, and apparently, like, insinuated, oh, he's just recycling this idea from Studio One. Hmm. So, meanwhile, Reginald Rose, the writer of this uh, episode, sent the writer of that column a letter saying, like, thank you for writing that, and maybe there's some suspicion that he kind of put her up to it. But at the same hmm. time, wrote a letter to Rod Serling being like, uh, the, don't worry about that TV Guide lady, she's crazy. <laughs> so, do you want to do my episode? <laughs> and... So Serling took Dang. the bait. And, uh, There's a lot going on in this backroom <laughs> dealings. Know. This is actually probably would have made a better episode. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, so that was kind of the history of that. And I think Serling felt enough time had passed between walking distance by the fourth season. So they decided yeah. to put it into um, production. And then there was a lot of back and forth about how the ending needed to be changed. So that's why they did mm-hmm. that. Um, but that's it for Grams. Pat Hingle played Horace Ford. He was a Tony Award nominee. He made his acting debut in third grade, playing a carrot in a school play. (laughs) Nice. It was during the run of JB, that play that I just mentioned, that Hingle took an accidental plunge down an elevator shaft of his New York apartment building, sustaining near-fatal injuries in the 54-foot fall. Whoa. Yeah, he was near death for two weeks, and he lost only well i'm sure he had other injuries but he lost the little finger of his left hand yeah his total recovery took more than a year and one of the consequences of this is he lost the lead role in the film elmer gantry Hmm. while he was recuperating burt lancaster took the role and got an oscar for it so that's a bummer (laughs) in more recent years hingle played commissioner gordon in the batman movies um obviously the like pre-nolan ones he went to the University of Texas on a tuba scholarship. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Ilya, he looks like a tuba player. Yeah, Kazan gave him his big screen break. Uh, he had an unbilled role as a bartender and on the waterfront. Hmm. I feel like there were a lot of people who came out of the actor's studio on the Twilight Zone, but yeah. I don't know if that was just like a lot of actors in general in this era were coming out of there. But uh, Nan Martin, who played his wife, was also in a couple of 80s Twilight Zone episodes. Some eagle-eyed viewers might remember her as the mother of Freddy Krueger hmm. in A Nightmare on Elm Street 3. Nice. Is that yes. the homoerotic one, or is that two? No, no. That's the probably arguably the best in the <laughs> series, the Dream Warriors. Right, um, right. The one you're talking about is two, yes. Freddy's Revenge. Is the Dream Warriors the one where Freddy just kind of like drops all pretense and just starts cursing out the kids? Yeah, yeah. It's like there's a shift about halfway yeah. through, and he's like, "Yeah, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna start enjoying my work. Yeah. I'm gonna have a little fun." With the it. first few, he kind of like seems all menacing, and then by the yeah. third or fourth, he's like, "You nerdlinger son of a bitch!" <laughs> exactly. That's sorry. Terrible. Sorry. Go on. Uh, written by Reginald Rose, who created the popular in its day TV series The Defenders, mm. and he most famously wrote Twelve Angry Men, really, huh. um, which is one of my favorite movies. He the episode was directed by Abner Bieberman, yeah. <laughs> which I assume was Justin Bieber's original yeah. name. I just thought it like I it just sounds so much like an anagram of another name. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. um, it's kind of a weird, yeah. funny side note. But Abner Bieberman also was an actor. I don't know if you're about to say this, but uh-huh. uh, he is in one of my favorite movies, Another Thin Man, or he's, he's uh-huh. in the Thin Man series, and I love that series. And plays a character named Dum Dum. And another thin man. And he's actually very good at it. He's a very fun character actor. Abner Bieberman sounds like the kind of name you change when you get <laughs> yeah. to Hollywood. <laughs> yeah. Just a bit, yeah. Uh, he also directed I Am the Night, Color Me Black. Number 12 looks just like you in The Dummy. And that brings us to the... Inevitable. 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 So we like to find connections between Mystery Science Theater 3000 and The Twilight Zone. What do we got this week, John? I'm fairly certain I did not do this one before. I looked through my notes. I didn't go to the actual episode, so I might have done this before, but I don't think so. Philip Pine played Leonard O'Brien. He mm-hmm. also played Verge in The Four of Us Are Dying. Oh, he, he was, was the a... office worker dude? Or no, was he the... Yeah. D- oh, Verge? Um, Verge was just one of the faces, I think. No, but in this episode, he was the, co- the office co-worker? Yeah, oh, I okay, think so. Yeah. I guess Verge was probably the the gangster. 
He was the Verge yeah. Sturgill or whatever. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so he was in the sixth season episode San Francisco International. Oh right! So I actually just watched some of last one. night. Yeah, IMDb yeah. rating is six point six. Cool. Pretty very low. low. Pretty very pretty very, very low, low for yeah. Twilight Zone. Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, the episode is is bad for all the reasons we've discussed. There's there are yeah. some things to like about it. I think like. It's a little bit different than the average Twilight Zone episode. There's not much mm-hmm. Twilight Zone-y stuff. There's a lot of like interpersonal drama between the family, which kind of sets it apart. I don't know if it was any good. Uh, uh, how do you feel? It's like it's sub five for sure. But what what do you think? Right. My problem might be that knowing the writer wrote Twelve Angry Men, <laughs> like yeah. just made me think like, well, it's got to be good somehow because yeah. I think that's so extremely well written, and that makes me think like there's a germ of a good idea somewhere. But and I. I do think the directing is fairly well done. I think there's there's moments of staging that are impressive, but overall it's not good. It's I'd say three minus is kind of where I'm going for. I was thinking three plus just because I I, I want to believe. <laughs> I want to believe people. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I don't know. Hey. It's it's I could I could see people putting it even lower just yeah, with. Uh, sure. Oh, makes a lot of toys, frisbee yeah. or whatever. His name yeah, is. yeah. I'm, but I'm. I don't know. Yeah. Let's threes seem good. I'll, three plus. You say three minus. Average to a three. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Three. Okay. Three plus. Three minus for the <laughs> the aptly titled "The Incredible World of Horus Ford." We didn't even talk about that, but that's. This is the terrible title for this episode. It really <laughs> makes no sense. Billy and the Clonosaurus. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, every 10 episodes, we like to do an iconic one. Uh, next week is our 120th episode. Um, we're going to do The Monsters Are Due on Maple Street next week. So check it out. Big it's iconic. Yes. What was that? Very iconic. Yes, yes it's very iconic. Um, if you want to get in touch with us and request an episode or send us an email, uh, please do so. There's lots of ways to do it. John, what are they? You could send us an email at twilightpwn, pwn at gmail.com. You can get in touch with us on Twitter. You could, at twilightpwn, you could check out our website, twilightpwn.tumblr.com. You could listen to us on Stitcher or any kind of podcatcher app. Or you could subscribe to us on iTunes. If you're over there, if you leave us a review, we'd really appreciate those. Speaking of which, thanks to our buddy Craig. Yeah. Wrote us a very nice thanks, review. Craig. So thank you very much. Um, so if you could go back in time to a specific, like, you know, like a street or a place in your childhood, mm. what would it be? Just for like a little bit of time? Yeah, um, yeah, just to, just to Horace Fordian visit. It's funny, Any... I just thought of, like, for a short period of time when we moved to Oklahoma, we lived in a rental and there was like a 7-Eleven, well, quick trip right down the street that had a Street Fighter II turbo machine. <laughs> that just popped into my head. It's like, I didn't even have that great a time there, but I don't know. I guess for a month or two, I really liked playing that. Yeah. I think I could think of better things, but that free association, that's the first thing I thought yeah. of. What, what about you? Uh, 7-Eleven down the street that had a really killer game of Ring Alivio Turbo. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Cool. All right, cool. Uh, I'll talk to you next week, John. All right, later for late. I don't know if you see like uh, you know turn of the century street urchin right after your <laughs> husband said like I saw kids from my past when you have at least a couple questions well, I didn't really interpret him as a turn of the century street urchin like why did you think he was a turn of the he, he, he wasn't like dressed in, in like, my head he's like all dirty and he's missing teeth and he, oh people I, wore I missing teeth like, in 1963 I don't I don't know what to say to that, Fred. I don't know the history of dentistry as well as you. <laughs> you know nothing of ancient dentistry. <laughs> oh, God. I hope somebody got that one. Um, yeah.